Proposals to reform the ACC personal injury system to include all disability and to help the hundreds of thousands of injured and sick New Zealanders whose claims are declined each year. Barrister and researcher Warren Forster will spend the next 18 months developing recommendations to create a no-fault system that doesn't distinguish between sickness and accidents. He has been awarded the highest legal research award, the 2017 New Zealand Law Foundation International Research Fellowship, which provides recipients with up to $125,000 for study that makes a significant contribution to our law. Earlier this year, Warren Forster led research that found ACC was out of step with the wider network of institutions managing injury. It also concluded that reform would better help injured people and in the long run reduce the economic and social costs of injury to society. For more than a decade, Warren Forster has researched and reported on flaws in the system and advocated for ACC claimants. It began with his own mother's claim being declined in 2005, which led him to return to study the law, first to represent her and then into years of researching and specialising in the ACC system. In this latest project, work will be done to examine overseas systems with a view to ending the current discrimination in the no-fault insurance scheme that is based on the cause of disability. Warren Forster is in the Christchurch studio. Good morning. Good morning, Catherine, and kia ora to you and the visitors. This is a big ask to develop an idea that could effectively become a legal system in just 12 to 18 months. What are you hoping to achieve? Well, first of all, I can't uh, do it all myself within 12 to 18 months. I have to be realistic, Catherine. If I go back to Sir Owen and his report in 1967, um, it took five years for it to be picked up by Parliament and then a few more years to be implemented. So nothing's going to happen in terms of substantive change quickly. But we've got an opportunity here to finish the work that he started. He set out a vision that was uh, very forward thinking. And we've, we've lost our way. Um, and the question now is, you know, what is the effect of what we're doing? And, and you know, should we have another think about how we do disability in New Zealand? So Geoffrey Palmer tried to do something similar in 1987 to 1990. Uh, how will this be different? Well, I like to think third time lucky, Catherine. Um, we go back to um, Sir Owen, and, and he set out a vision. And then, as you say, um, Sir Geoffrey picked it up in, in the, the late 80s. Uh, but what we have now, which is different, is we have so much more information. And what we've become is a system that uh, shifts cost from the public health system to uh, the justice system or from ACC to the health system. And we need to really step back and think, what is the effect of this on our society over a long period of time? Um, so we've got the opportunity to go away and do a lot of thinking um, to, to look at what has been picked up and what the developments have been um, in the last 50 years and then really try and figure out whether we can redesign how we do things in New Zealand and cut out all the process cost of doing an assessment here and an assessment there. By the time you've been to see ACC surgeon, you've been to the surgeon of the public health system and you've got an independent report, you've spent three or four hours of surgeon's time writing reports where you could probably do the surgery for three or four hours. And the other kind of questions that, that we need to really think about as a society and say, are we doing this the best way we can? We're told that our no-fault injury compensation system is, or at least was, world-leading. So where else will you look? Well, it was world-leading 50 years ago. Um, but where we've come to now is, uh, is something slightly different. And each place overseas faces a similar problem. We've all signed up to the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. We all say we shouldn't discriminate based on cause and we should treat people fairly and equally. But no one's really cracked this nut yet. Um, so Scandinavia's gone in a particular direction with some systems that they have. Germany's just developing a new system which deals with some bits very well. Um, Ireland has some ideas. Iceland has some ideas. Uh, Canada, uh, particular states in Canada and Australia. So everyone's picked up bits of it and there's bits that they do well. But no one's yet designed the overall system and said, here's how we need to deal with this. Um, so, for example, um, access to buildings. Should we have uh, retrofitting of every building when a person needs a doorway to get in with a wheelchair? Or should we say, let's just design this problem away? Um, and the same thing for, you know, across the board. But, you know, should we have retrofitting of everyone's bathroom when they need to, to have a shower that they can wheel into? Or should we say, let's rethink how we do this? 
um, every 30 years, many bathrooms in New Zealand get redesigned and, and, and put in. So why don't we just design away much of these barriers that, that cause the problems? You are looking widely then, but on the question of sickness and distinguishing between sickness and accidents, I was just looking up the figures this morning. Last year, or this year rather, claims costs, this is ACC's last annual report, claims costs increased by 6% to $3.7 billion. We fund the system, that's the point. We pre-funded, a lot of money is invested to maintain a significant pool of funding to be drawn down on. But that's nearly $4 billion of costs to be paid out. What are you talking about and what would the impact be of not distinguishing between sickness and accidents? Well, first of all, Catherine, um, I, I have to acknowledge that the costs are going up of ACC, but we have to ask ourselves why. Has there been a reporting bias where these things have been subdued over the last few years? And I think the answer is definitely yes. We also need to think about how much we spend processing Though that four point whatever billion dollars it is, um, I couldn't catch three point seven, three point seven billion, three point seven billion, um, and we need to ask ourselves where's that money coming from and how's it being spent. So we spend hundreds of millions of dollars administering ACC alone. We spend a lot of money administering this through the health system and the same thing through wins, um, and. We need to to really sort of step back and say, what is the cost of this going to be? And I don't have the answer yet. Um, I'm not an economist and I'm going to need expertise from outside my area to come in and help. But we need to to think, are we actually reducing the cost or are we shifting the cost? So that the reporting bias where we don't actually know what the cost is truly um, because we shift it from one system to another we need to try and find a way to capture that entire cost. Because if someone's you know, surgery has declined or someone's uh, social support has declined on the basis that the, uh, there was a birth-related problem and it's not covered by ACC, someone still has to care for those children. Someone still has to put all that social support in place. So we, we need to try and find a way that we don't shift cost from one institution to another or from one government agency to another or f- to the families. Isn't, isn't that the risk, though, that if you broaden the net, and I do want to get specific about the sickness mm. proposal, that if you broaden the net, you're going to have the ACC system taking on more of the costs currently in the health system. We know the pressure the health system is under. We know that the new government, I think, is planning to put billions, a very large proportion of any new funding it has available to it just to try and top up the health system. You mentioned uh, the, the work and income or the social welfare system as well. Is there a risk that if you cast the net too widely, you are going to put pressure on the ACC system, transfer pressure onto it that is currently elsewhere? Undoubtedly, there will be pressure on the ACC system. But we also have to look upon that as an opportunity. At the moment, ACC is meant to fund the health system, the cost of treating injuries, and they're not doing it. We don't know how much they're falling short, but ACC is incentivised not to properly fund the health system. And the health system's left holding the, the bucket at the end. And, and what happened in one example is surgery. When ACC doubles the number of surgeries it declined, there's not a corresponding memo that goes to the Minister of Health saying, hey, health system, you're about to be hit here with a massive increase in elective surgery. Um, so when that flows through for a period of five or ten years, you've got hundreds of thousands of people waiting for surgery. And, and that really is just cost shifting. We need to acknowledge what it is. Affordability needs to be forefront. And we need to say one of the principles of this is affordability. Then we need to work out what the cost is and decide what's affordable. Shifting it round from one place to another isn't a sensible thing to design a system to do. And we've got the opportunity now to redesign it. I completely appreciate what you're saying about the shifting of costs out of ACC onto health, and I want to come back into how your research has evidenced some of that. But I'm talking about it coming back the other way if entitlements are broadened to include sickness. And and what do you envisage there? For example, let's take that case that's in the news right now where effectively you have an injury, what, that you would argue is, is the result of an illness. I'm talking about the, the family that's been hit very hard with a, with a case of botulism from eating wild boar. So when you look at that case as we've, from what we know about it, would you say that they ought to be covered by ACC? Well, look, to answer your question from a legal perspective, no, they're not covered. 
Um, and if I can just compare the botulism situation with the Campylobacter situation in the Hawke's Bay, two very, very similar cases. Now, the one in the Hawke's Bay, arguably, there was someone at fault. So we, we have a, an argument, ACC says they won't cover it because uh, it doesn't meet the criteria of a criminal act. Botulism, I don't think there's any suggestion of a criminal act. But the outcome is very similar. You have people who are going through a problem that they need to interact with the health system, they need some social support, they need some financial support, and they need some rehabilitation. If you take that family, um, should we say, well, it's actually that the public health system should do this bit. Once they leave the public health system, their family should provide the social support. And let's not worry about rehabilitation because it's not up to us as society to fund it. That's a pretty outdated way of looking at it. If we can say, well, maybe they can't return to work at this point, so let's see what we can do to help them. And there's been a bunch of studies done um, in Dunedin with the potential outcomes of injury study, the POISE study, where they compared people who had a similar impairment. So they looked at people who had brain injuries and looked at people who had strokes. Um, and they said those that actually get the support to get through the immediate crisis, um, their disability experience is actually much less than the people who don't have support going through it. So the people who have the brain injury and get cover from ACC and support, and I know there's a group that doesn't, but those that do, come out the other side uh, in a much better position than those who have stroke. And what we need to do is think about should we as a society step in and help minimise that impact and support the person through that process of change? Or should we say, well, actually, it's not my problem, it's not your problem, it's the family's problem, and if they don't have insurance against botulism, um, then then too bad. And we, we have flow-on impacts that go well beyond the immediate problem that we see in front. These people have families. What happens if they can't support their families and their houses and relationships? And all of these problems flow on into society and end up costing us a lot of money. It all makes um, sense. It makes tremendous sense. It, it, but shouldn't that support, similar support, be provided to the families of stroke victims? The question is whether it should be ACC funded out of people's levies, as they are now, or whether it should be funded out of a health system or a disability system or a work and income system that we're functioning better. It's the, the when, we, when we have multiple systems and we incentivise each system to perform in a particular way, then we're always going to have cost shifting between systems. We need one system. I don't really mind if we call this the Woodhouse system, the disability system, the ACC system or the Blue House and Auckland system. What you call the thing doesn't matter. The, the key point from a person's perspective is that they go along and they say, I need help. I need this kind of help to help me through this process. Where can I get it? And the last thing that we should have is a system where people need to go into 20 different organisations to try and get help, uh, where they go from pillar to post and, and people give up. Will this uh, then affect how what we're currently calling and understand is the ACC system, the injury system, is funded? Because if you extended this... Um, and indeed to stroke, if you extended it, I don't know, to, to, to diabetes, or which we know we're in, the, heading for, in an epidemic, I think, and, and heading for a, a greater one, again, you can straight away see the costs piling up. Now, the sense of the service delivery that you're outlining is obvious. How it is funded is less obvious, because currently the provisions of ACC are levy based. Are you talking about maybe having a tax transfer from some of these other systems? You know, are, are you going to look at the financials? Yes, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to design a, a system that says here's the cost that the levy should be. But what I'm going to look at is how can we redesign what we do? And take, for example, the health system. The health system's funded through tax. The increases that were put in place by the previous government didn't keep pace with what's called the labour cost index. So as wages went up, and wages are a big part of the health system, the, the funding to the health system didn't increase accordingly. So similar to ACC, some bits go up with the labour cost index and some go up with general inflation. So we need to say, are we funding the health system in the most sensible way we can? How much is the health system spending doing these kind of disputes and cost shifting? Shouldn't we just have one system? And if we have one system, then we need to have a conversation about how we're going to fund it. So if we look overseas, um, different social insurance models do different bits, um, but not many of them have a central overall view about what's happening. Um, and maybe 
the time is right to have a conversation as a society about how we fund this and, and where the money goes and how it flows. Because the, the model of ACC, and a lot of people don't really understand this, with the capital reserves they have, which is great, ACC does that financial bit amazingly well. They return above benchmark returns on their investments year after year. So they effectively use the international stock market to fund part of our ACC system. There's no principled reason why they can't just extend that out. We're not talking about stopping ACC doing the bits that it does really well. But what we need to do is have another think about how we can make all of the bits of the system work together. So you're talking about a one-stop shop disability model, whatever cause. The, the other reason that I flag the, the, the costs if the uh, things currently dealt with in the health system come under this system is that you're going to find yourself again for that taxpayer health dollar competing with cancer drugs for which there's huge demand, new generation cancer drugs with Parkinson's treatments, with stem cell treatments, with all the challenges of rationing to use a word no one wants to use but is increasingly our reality that the health system has to deal with. Uh, do you believe there is a way under a one-stop shop disability model to not end up in, in, in that kind of competition? We have a big question to ask ourselves about how we fund health. I completely accept that. I don't think how we're doing it now is the most sensible way to do it, and I think that it has an impact on people. But if we take cancer, for example... Um, if we can help the person with treatment and maintain their their livelihood and maintain their relationships in the community and all of these things, surely we're going to be better off. And we can't even have those discussions at the moment because someone who has cancer isn't covered by ACC. They need, if they don't have a, a, the entitlement through the WIN system, then the cost falls on their family. There's still a cost there. And we just need to have a rethink about how we do it. And affordability has to be one of the, the guiding principles. We have to be able to have that conversation. And we have to be able to forefront it and discuss it, Catherine. At the moment, no one ever says, oh, well, the, the key problem with ACC is it's, it's trying to balance affordability against, um, against service provision. That all happens behind the scenes, and it's almost hush-hush. And what I'm saying is, well, let's forefront that. Let's accept that affordability to our society and how we fund it is actually one of the key bits. And let's see if we can make that work really efficiently rather than the current system, which is cost-shifting. Let's talk about some of the specific faults in the system that you've identified through previous work, because I'm interested, again, in, in uh, where you're going to go in this. Uh, we've talked about the bureaucracy. One of your findings was that the number of claims declined is likely massively underreported. Just remind me of how you reached that conclusion of it likely being in the hundreds of thousands rather than the official figure. Well, ACC's now come out and recognised it's um, in the high 90s, so I'm going to use 100,000 there. They've also recognised it doesn't count all the things. So I wrote back to ACC and the minister and I said, here's all the other bits that you haven't counted. Can you go and count them too, please? And they haven't yet. But if we use 100,000 as a figure, which I don't think anyone can dispute, um, because it's easy for my maths, and we then give $10,000 of dispute resolution costs to that dispute. So we then pay lawyers and doctors to have a dispute for 100,000 people a year. That's a billion dollars of cost we're going to add to the system if we dispute those 100,000 cases. And when we're going down this road of looking at how do we redesign ACC, how do we resolve these access to justice barriers, if it's 100,000 cases and, and people engage a dispute resolution process, we're going to throw another billion dollars of cost in. If it's 200,000, then we're going to throw $2 billion of cost. And one of the key things is, is that a good use of public money? Or is there a better way to overcome these causation disputes by cutting out the boundary drawing exercise that we currently have? And one of the key things there is, if we're going to redesign this, and drafting the law's easy, but if we're going to redesign it and we're going to move the dispute somewhere else, and we're just going to move another 100,000 disputes about causation to 100,000 disputes with the DHB system each year about who should pay for what treatment, that's not a good idea. Is there a way that we can move the boundary so we don't have these access just to justice barriers recreated elsewhere? And, that, and that, that's the kind of, that's the space that I want to look at and say, where's a smart way to draw a line? The causation was a big 
factor in all this and, and just remind us again the, the, from, again from research that you've done going through cases, tons of cases, the way an initial injury is reported by a GP or other professional will affect the claim even if it's an initial observation rather than something that's been through fuller tests and discovery, right? Completely. So you turn up to your GP and they say, well, um, I can lodge a claim for a sprain of your shoulder. Um, and then it goes into ACC's data algorithm and it says, oh, actually, we should approve that claim because it's going to be low cost. So that person goes down a process. Um, after six weeks, they then realise, well, they probably knew at the beginning that it's more than a sprain or strain. So then you're organised to go and see a, a, a particular type of doctor who's allowed to order MRI scans. So you go through that process, the MRI, MRI scan comes back and says, well, actually, you've got um, tendon tears and they're a gradual process. So by that stage, you go and see a surgeon, and he says, well, I think the gradual process is consequential on a previous injury, and he sends that to ACC. And then ACC has their own internal panel, looks at it and says, well, no, we disagree, and they write a report. And then you go back to your surgeon, or you might go and get a second opinion. We could have just done the surgery. And that's the kind of problem that we see being recreated. And as we're looking at how we improve access to justice, I'm very conscious of creating another big costly dispute resolution process, which is what Wardhouse actually sort of said at the beginning, we need to avoid this. And that's when it, it sort of got us to think and say, well, what's another way around this? And we went back to uh, the 1967 report 50 years ago this week, amazing. And Woodhouse foresaw these problems. He said, we need to make sure we don't have this drift back to formalism or drift back to legalism, where we recreate all of the problems of the common law system in our new model. And he recognised that one way to avoid that is to cut out this distinction, to cut out the boundary drawing between cause of disability. And what we're thinking now is, well, should we go back and have another look at that? And what the Law Foundation, with this very generous award, has allowed us to do is to, to go back and say, let's think about this again. Well, the other factor, of course, that I, I think, again, was your work, but certainly the story we have been covering for many years, I think it was physiotherapists who first alerted us to what was happening, was the issues with age degeneration being used to decline claims. And one can argue that we all degenerate with age and our population demographic is getting older. But sometimes this was being used when there had been an obvious and devastating injury, such as a vehicle accident. Again, would this proposal that you're working on pretty much eliminate that as an issue to be challenged? Yes, because it's pointless having a fight about cause. It is a complete waste of resources, and it's only used as a discriminator about how people are treated. And what we're, what I'm saying, which is, you know, our law says we can't discriminate based on age and sex and gender and disability and so on, but we have a lot of systems that actually do that. When a person who is older, and I'm getting, you know, older myself, Catherine, my hair's going grey and I'm sure I'm starting to degenerate, but um, the whole point is... How should we deal with a problem? And dealing with a problem by having all of these boundary disputes and saying, well, actually, it's your problem, you're getting old. Well, it doesn't matter if I'm getting old or not. If I can get the help that I need, then that will help me get back to work rather than shifting that cost onto me and my family. And th there's a whole group of people out there, Catherine, who want to work. Um, if we had the accessible workplaces and if we had online information that was accessible for someone who is blind, then we're going to start being able to take a group of people who want to work and get them as a productive member of our society. So this is a great opportunity to say, rather than put someone in a category and say, you're going to be on a benefit, to say, how can we actually help you reintegrate with the workforce, because you look at employment outcomes for persons with disabilities, 25 to 30 percent of people with disabilities have participation in the labour market. That's unacceptable. We have to change that, not just for the people, but for our society. What, what, How much better off are we going to be if we can do that? What are, what are ACC's results for those they do accept, actually, and put through rehabilitation processes? And are they good results? Well, the answer, Catherine, is we don't know because the only measure of outcome that ACC keeps is a bureaucratic exit. So once the person has a decision saying, you've left the system, that's all we know. We don't go and say, are you actually working? We don't go and say, how many hours are you working? We don't go and say, 
have you returned to your pre-injury earnings capability? And when we've done the big complete data sets where we've looked at a population, so um, and we've we've linked, there's a thing called the linked employee employer data set. And what they did is they looked at people who'd been off work um, on ACC, and they looked at what the earnings were into the future. And so they obviously did this retrospectively. And they said once someone's been off work for more than three months, they have long-term loss of earnings caused by the accident. And this is just for ACC. We don't do it as well as that we claim to. So the, the predictive analytics tool, for example, the outcome variable, the thing that they measure is exit from ACC. No one can say what happens to those people. If it was actually a real life outcome they were measuring and predicting, great, but it's not. And we know that um, something like 20% of people who've been off work for more than, I think it's 18 months, end up being transferred from ACC onto a benefit. Um, there's a whole other group who aren't actually working at all and they're not on a benefit because they're being supported by their family. But again, this is just cost shifting. And what I'm trying to do is think about can we design a system in a way that actually has real life outcomes for people as a target and a measure. You look around the world, who will you talk to here about working within the system or indeed health economists because it's hard to see how you can go past some of the warnings they're sending about the impossibility of health budgets again. And if, and if this is about improving rather than, as I said, ending up in competition over scarce resources, um, I'm sure that's something you want to bear in mind. But who do you anticipate talking to as you begin to fashion a possible new system? Well, th there's different bits of the system, Catherine, and there's different experts on different bits. So if we look at healthcare, there's some leading health economists, there's some in Otago, there's some in Auckland, I'm sure there's people in Wellington and Christchurch who have views that they want to share as well. If we look at income support, then we need to look at how the ACC model's working, we need to look at what happens with uh, wins. If we then look at social support, we need to look at how we provide care when care is required. Um, so we need to look at the disability sector as a whole, and we need to look at ACC and see how that works. So different experts will have expertise in different things, and what I need to do is to try and get uh, people together and have this conversation. And before we throw the baby out with the bath water, we're going to need some economists to actually come in and say, yes, no, yes, no, here's what the effect will be. But I think part of that discussion is actually putting on the table the stuff that we don't currently measure um, and then looking at that and saying, here's how the system is operating and here's how we can try and redesign it. But I can't do this myself. I'll need help. Um, the generous funding from the Law Foundation will get us so far, but we're going to need others to come on board and say, here's you know, what we know about health models. Here's four different ways of doing it, and the government's actually doing some work here too. So we're going to need people to, to come on board with this project and, and share their vision, share their ideas, and, and importantly, identify the problems. But my project will go along the lines of working out some principles then trying to develop a number of different models and see how they would work, and then testing those models against those principles. Um, it's a, it's going to be a big task, Catherine. Um, and sure as I say, is. Sir, Sir Owen tried it, <laughs> Sir Geoffrey tried it, um, yeah. and uh, and now it's my turn to, to, to have a go. There, there might not be a, a, a great answer, but we need to, to have a conversation with, as a society about this, and what we're doing now is really just the start of that. Well, it's a culmination also of a decade's very hard work, so all the best for it. Thanks for Thank talking you. to us. Warren Forster.